To be quite honest, Jeff probably doesn't even need an introduction. If I said that he's the author of Lean UX, everybody will probably know the book and who he is. Jeff is a superhuman. He is super talented and super experienced. Here to give a case study in sharing the story of John Deere, who people may or may not know, but if I say the next bit, I love a good tractor. Please welcome Jeff to NUX6. Thanks. Nicely done. Hey folks, what's going on? Once again, it's me in front of beer. All right. We could do this. is a good story, though. You're going to like this story. I love telling this story, and I think you're going to like it. And there's a lot of stuff to take away from here. Uh, this is really, uh, 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 we found this to be a fascinating case study in thinking through all of the implications of product development and product design and how um, the, the elements of culture, the elements of technology, the elements of the law, uh, the elements of economics, of product development, of design, all come together to create what is seemingly an uh, amazing experience and where uh, some of the challenges rise in that amazing experience. And so, uh, we call the story episode two, The Farm Awakens. Like any good story, uh, it has uh, these components, six acts, six separate acts. We have a hero, we have an empire. And we have an unlikely ally that comes to our hero's aid. And then hopefully we have a little bit of a moral at the end of that story. So, like any good story, we're going to start with a little framing mechanism to set the tone. And in this particular case, uh, we could start with one of the more popular framing mechanisms for people who make digital products and services. And that would be the product requirements document. No, I'm just kidding. It's not going to be the product requirements document. It's going to be the more modern version of that, and it's going to be the hypothesis statement. You've heard a lot about hypotheses over the course of the day today. And this is the simplest framing device that we've found, that I've found, when it comes to thinking through the thing that you're going to build or make for your customers and for your users, right? We believe, we don't know, there's humility in there, right? There's unpredictability and uncertainty in, in digital product development. We believe that meeting some kind of a user need Right? Something the user is trying to do with a set of features or a product or a service will create some kind of a business outcome that we care about. And we'll know we're right when we see this evidence. Now we're going to use this framing mechanism. We're going to keep coming back to this. As I tell you the story, we're going to keep coming back to this uh, hypothesis template and we're going to fill in the blanks. And we're going to see if we can get to a hypothesis statement that actually makes sense at the end of it. Okay, so let's start with the user need, or as any good Friday afternoon conversation should talk about, the brutal economics of wheat farming. <laughs> Not sure you, you know what you signed up for today, but we're going to talk about wheat farming today. Wheat farming is fascinating. And uh, to, to talk about wheat farming, we have to meet our hero. Our hero is a humble farmer, struggling to eke out a living, in a, in a hostile environment. <laughs> it's not that guy. Uh, it's these guys, though. Um, it's, it's the, uh, the farmers of, in this case, the American heartland, right? And the thing that's really important to remember about uh, farmers, and particularly wheat farmers, is that farmers don't market wheat. Right? They don't take ads out, there's no Google AdWords, there's no billboards out on Interstate 70 in, in Nebraska somewhere that says, you know, wheat, it's what's for dinner. Right? None of that stuff is actually there. Uh, in fact, the market doesn't even consider how much it costs to produce wheat when determining the price. The only thing that the wheat market cares about is how much is uh, being demanded, Right? and how much the consumer will pay for that wheat. That's it. That's all that matters. Now, if you're the wheat farmer, at any given moment, you're doing, you know, this, this is your, your, your landscape, right? At any given moment, a farmer can easily have millions of dollars in the ground waiting to be harvested at just the right moment. We're talking about seed, labor, uh, fertilizer, chemicals, uh, you name it, right? Equipment costs. Everything is in the ground, and all of that money that's in the ground is at risk. It's at risk from weather. It's at risk from insects and fungus and weird crop circles that may come up every now and again, right? All of these things are putting that investment that that wheat farmer put in the ground at risk. 
Now, to give you a sense of how much risk we're talking about here, uh, nothing better on a Friday afternoon than to do some math. Let's do some math for a second. Um, if, if you don't know much about wheat farming, uh, we'll get through this very, very quickly, I promise. A bushel of wheat, which is the, the unit of measure, is 60 pounds. 60 pounds of wheat. Now, we, took, we, we try to find a, kind of an average farmer, particularly in the U.S. heartland. Um, this is a wheat farmer in Grant County, Oklahoma, uh, tries to get about 50 bushels of wheat out of every acre of land, and the total cost to farm that acre is $274. Again, that's seed, labor, uh, fun, you know, fungicide, uh, chemicals, that type of thing. And so it costs you 274 bucks to farm that. Uh, you're trying to get 50 bushels out of every acre. That means your break-even price is $5.48 a bushel. You need to make that to break even, to make no money, make $0. When we wrote this talk, the market price of wheat was $5.59. That means the profit margin on a bushel of wheat is 11 cents. 11 cents, right? Now, you multiply that uh, times, the, uh, times uh, per acre, profit per acre, by the number of bushels is 550, and the average farm size in the U.S. is about 438 acres. You're looking at an average total profit from a wheat harvest of $2,409. Right? That's a razor-thin margin, right? All of that effort, all of that investment in the ground, and your average profit is $2,400. And that leaves a ton to chance. That means you're harvesting everything, and you're maximizing the productivity of your land, right? Now, we talked to a lot of farmers when we uh, came up with this talk, and we learned a lot of really cool uh, things that farmers say. For example, they talk about rain makes grain, right? So when it rains, that's really good for farmers, and that makes the wheat grow. But if it rains too much, right, you end up with this condition called wheat with wet feet, which essentially are the conditions that allow for fungus to grow, and you're threatening the crop again. And so the timing of getting the wheat out of the ground is crucial. It's absolutely critical that you get the wheat out of the ground harvested when it's ready or before it gets too wet or before harvesting comes. In fact, as we try to talk to farmers during this, timing became an issue. We interviewed some farmers. In fact, one of the guys we talked to was this guy named Steve Pitstick. He's a farmer out in the American Midwest. He said, look, I can't talk to you this week because it's planting season. Right? I'll talk to you next week. Timing is everything. Right? You can't wait for anything to get things out of the ground because if you wait too long, the crop dies and your razor-thin margin evaporates plus the investment that you put in. So, what are our user needs? Well, our user needs are lower costs. It has to cost me less to produce this crop. I'd like more efficiency. Right? I'd like to do this faster, better, smarter. Right? So my, my uh, profit margins go up and I need to obey Mother Nature's schedule. Right? I cannot wait for anything to get in the way of this, right? And so we come back to our hypothesis uh, template and we fill it out, right? We believe that uh, helping farmers meet their cost and efficiency goals with timeliness concerns will help us build a great product. That's act one. Act two, or as we like to say, meanwhile, back at headquarters, right? <laughs> That's not headquarters. I mean, it's, it's, I'm being harsh, right? This is headquarters. Right? This is what, what kind of the, the, the equipment manufacturers look like. There's product managers and designers and engineers and industrial designers right? and mechanical engineers building products and systems to help farmers out. And there's no company that's doing more interesting thing in the agriculture space than John Deere. John Deere is literally the Harley Davidson of farm equipment. They have been around for over a hundred years and the farmers that buy John Deere products love these products. They're so loyal to this brand. They call themselves a Deere operation. We're a Deere farm, right? They've been using these, these Deere, John Deere products for decades, right? To show you how far that loyalty goes, <laughs> and I don't recommend scrolling any further than this. I'm not even joking. <laughs> Proceed at your own risk. Right? Those are some, there's some big ones, big tattoos on there too. Those are really big. And this, look, there's good reason for this, right? These are the biggest, 
the baddest, the greenest machines out there. It's really cool. This was a really fun project to, uh, to work on and, and learn about. These are amazing, amazing machines that can do things that you never actually imagined and at a level of efficiency that never thought possible before. And it's not just tractors. Right? They don't just make these tractors and these combines. John Deere uh, makes what they call precision agriculture technology. Now, precision ag technology is everything you see up here. It's all the hardware, and it's all the software, and it's all the data collection, and all the analysis, and all of the kind of the feedback back to the machinery and to the farmers, right? It's a suite of products, hardware and software, designed to connect and automate multiple pieces of farm equipment and operations, and then help farmers make sense of all that data. All of this stuff has sensors all over it. They have GPS satellites, they have weather satellites, and they aggregate all that data, along with historical information, to feed it back to the machines and to the farmers so that they can extract the maximum harvest from the land. And so if you look at it that way, you can see that John Deere is a hardware company. They make tractors, combines, screens, sensors, uh, telematics, you name it. And they're also a software company. Right? They make data collection software. They build uh, uh, APIs. You know, there's a thousand people who work uh, at John Deere's headquarters in the American Midwest simply on displays and telematics and customer-facing web. Just a thousand people alone on that. Right? And so they've got lots and lots of software engineers building amazing products. They have an annual API integration conference for all this data because it's, it's highly valuable and it's used all over the world. And they do product discovery. They know their customers. They spend time in the field, literally in the field, <laughs> right? Um, they, uh, they, farmers love to give feedback because, again, they're so loyal to the brand. They want you to know how well or how poorly this particular thing that you're putting out there is working for me. And the farmers are out there. There is a strong early adopter segment, and they're always willing to give feedback. Now, the fascinating thing, and we, you know, we learned as we were doing this, uh, this research, is that these tractors aren't cheap. They're not cheap at all. In fact, uh, they, have a, they have a tractor wizard, like build your own tractor kind of thing on the John Deere website. I, they do. And uh, this is the starting price for these things. 400 grand. And by the time you, you kit the whole thing out with GPS and, and you know, AM, FM, cassette, <laughs> whatever else comes with it, right? No, but seriously, by the time you, you get this thing where you need it to go with all the services, it ends up being close to 900,000 or a million dollars. Right? It's absolutely amazing what these things can do and how much they cost, given those profit margins that we talked about at the beginning. Right? And so the question becomes, what is the business problem that these guys face, seemingly at the top of their game? Well, the brutal economics of wheat continue. Again, particularly in the United States, there's a move from single operations to leased operations. So very few farmers actually farm their own land. They lease it out to big corporations who have these massive tracts of land, right? About half the farms in the U.S. are rented out to, to a farmer who takes care of kind of all of the kind of a massive tract of land at once which frankly is the only way to generate any kind of meaningful profit as we demonstrated with our math lesson just a few minutes ago. Now that big operation is a big expense. Seed, labor, chemicals, right? All of those things. And so it's this technology that John Deere makes that helps farm larger areas with less labor, which reduces costs, right? Increase efficiency, increase profit margins, right? Less labor. The downside of less labor is that you have fewer farmers. And if you have fewer farmers, you're actually selling less tractors, right? There aren't as many people, you don't need as many machines to do as much of the work. And so the business problem that John Deere is facing is that equipment sales are down. Right? The sale of the stuff, the hardware that they're making is down. In fact, they're talking about 5% year over year and uh, roughly about 8% Overall, which is, translates into billions, tens of billions of dollars in lost equipment sales, which is a significant business problem for John Deere. So they find themselves in a position where they have to reconsider their business model, right? We can't be in the hardware business alone. There has to be another option, right? We sell software, we sell services, we aggregate data, we provide all this information. Is there a better way to monetize everything that we do and we know about the wheat farming business. And so, the business needs, 
Less reliance on equipment sales. Our business, the world is changing. We got to figure out what to do differently. We have to protect our margins. Right? We have to stay profitable. Most importantly, we cannot piss off our customers. Right? Because they're so loyal that as long as we, if we can keep them loyal, whatever we put out there, they will consume. So we cannot do that. Right? So we're back to our hypothesis statement and we start to fill it out. We believe that meeting the farmer's needs of cost and efficiency, of timeliness, right, with some kind of feature set, product set, whatever it is, right, will create less reliance on sales, higher margins, and maintain loyalty. Okay, we're getting there, got more to go. Act three, All right, the promise, the offer you can't refuse. So we're here, we've got a user need, and we have a business need. Now the amazing thing about this equipment as we've talked to farmers over the years is the fantastic advances, not only in the efficiency of these devices, of these machines, but in the user experience of these. It, you know, up until kind of the mid 60s, this is what these devices, these machines looked like, and at the end of the day, you ended up essentially frozen to death, or melted, or, and definitely covered in dust no matter what. And over the years, right, they, they get better, and they improve, and they start to have enclosed cabins, right, and they start to get literally like entertainment systems in there so you can hang out in there all day, um, until you get to the point where they, uh, you know, they look like this, and this is the kind of work that they actually do, right? They're enclosed, they can run all day, they're comfortable, you don't end up, they have air conditioning, <laughs> they have heat, <laughs> right? All of these components that you would, that you'd expect to have in a car, they have in these tractors. And in fact, that same farmer that we talked about earlier, um, he said, look, I can farm 2,500 acres easier today than I could farm 500 acres 40 years ago. Right? That's the kind of efficiency that they're looking for. And in fact, it gets even better. One of the most amazing things that I learned <laughs> while doing research for this is this. Check out who's driving that tractor. No one is driving that tractor. Right? Someone is driving that combine up there on the left, and they've harvested the wheat, and they need a hopper to come over so they can unload the, the harvest from the combine so they can keep rolling, so they don't have to stop and drive back to the farm. He pushes a button through GPS and automation, the other tractor just pulls up alongside. They fill it up and it goes back and the farmer can just do essentially the work of two people without stopping all day long, right? Artificial intelligence, GPS, automated farming, big data, all of that stuff is happening Right now, this is, this is real footage, right? Now, to make all this happen, you have to buy this equipment, and there's one catch. There's a license agreement, right? You have to agree to a license to use the software that's embedded in your $900,000 John Deere tractor. And when you sign that license, it says, look, this is an implied license. Right? Essentially, you're renting the software for the life of the vehicle to operate that vehicle. So you own the hardware, but you rent the software. Right? You don't actually own the entire thing that you bought. Right? And so if we look at the features that we think are going to meet the user needs and meet our business needs, we're talking about more efficient, right? amazing efficiency, more capable, more comfortable, right? increase our services revenue, we can start to figure out how to sell more data back into this and help farmers be more productive and a license agreement, right? As a feature that we think will be valuable. And as we start to plug in to our hypothesis statement, it starts to look very interesting, right? Cost, efficiency, and timeliness concerns with greater efficiency and capability um, and a license agreement will help create less reliance on sales, higher margins, and maintain loyalty. And that sounds great right? Until you run into some problems. Right. In Act 4, our hero encounters a problem. Now, the wheat is ripe. It's time to harvest. Remember, I told you, you can't wait. Fungus sets in, you're done, you lose the crop, and there's a problem for our hero. That's not the problem. Uh, this is the problem. The tractor broke down, right? 
Normally, you'd call your local repair guy to come over and fix the tractor. He'd be there quickly, an hour or two away. Or maybe you fix it yourself, right? Get you up and running so you can harvest before losing the wheat. But today, the problems are different. A lot of the breakdowns aren't mechanical these days. Oftentimes, they're software. And even if the breakdowns are mechanical, and even if you, as the farmer, have the part to fix it, you can't swap the part out without first accessing the software. And because you signed that license agreement, you are not allowed, as the farmer, to access that software. You can't circumvent the copyright protection of the software to allow the part swap or whatever it is. Only a certified John Deere mechanic can come, plug their laptop in, authorize the part swap, put it in, and get you up and running. Now, that's okay if there's a certified John Deere mechanic in your town where you live, right? But if you live in Great Falls, Montana, where wheat farmers live, your nearest John Deere dealer could be 500 miles away. And in the time that it would take that person to get to your farm, plug in their laptop, and allow you to swap the parts, you could lose the entire crop. Now, farmers have a culture of self-reliance. I can fix this myself, I can do it. But by agreeing to this implied license, by buying this advanced hardware and software, this Internet of Things component, right, they're no longer allowed to fix it themselves. Right? You have to either be a certified John Deere mechanic, right, or you have to get the machine to that mechanic to make it work. You simply can't fix it yourself. Right? Because of that license agreement. That's the reason. Now, how, how can this be, right? How can it be that there's a license agreement that says, hey, I paid a million dollars for this tractor. Why am I not allowed to fix it? Well, in the United States, we have a thing called the DMCA. It's, it's the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. It was enacted in 1998, 20 years ago. And at the time, it made it unlawful for users to circumvent copyright protection on software. Right? So you can't circumvent copyright protection to access or modify software. And it was intended to fight computer software piracy and DVD piracy. And that was cool in 1998. Right? But in the 20 years since then, software has eaten the world. Software is a part of pretty much every device and every component that we buy today. Right? From our coffee machines, to our cell phones, to our cars, and to our tractors. And so, Consumers find themselves in a position uh, where we're buying products and services. We feel like we own them, but we don't have the right to repair those services. Because again, modifying those objects requires access to information, to the code, to the service manuals, to error codes and diagnostic tools. But by providing that publicly, right, in any shape or, way, shape or form, you're, or, or accessing that, you are violating your license agreement, and the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Right? Cory Doctorow talks about this a lot, and he says, look, there was a time where you could buy something. And if you could manage to extract any extra value out of it, for example, you, you buy, a, buy a blender, right, and you turn it into a paint mixer, right, you get to keep all of that value. Right? Today, you can't do that, right? Any extra value that's added to the thing that you already buy gets kept by the manufacturer because of the technology that's within it, that's inherent in making it run. And so as the makers, the designers of digital products and services, when you find yourself in a situation like this, you have to ask yourself, are we solving user needs or are we exploiting user needs? Both will make you money, Right? The question is, which side do you want to be on? Which business do you want to be in? Right? Do you want to be in the solving user needs business or the exploiting user needs business? Now, before we continue the story, I want to just take a brief, uh, a brief interlude here and kind of, uh, kind of note something that's really important to this particular conversation. Right? How, when we're making digital products and services, right, how do we know what works? Right? How do we have any sense of what's actually going to work? Right? Um, the reality is that we don't, and it's primarily because of one big reason. Right? It's humans. Right? Humans interacting with our products in an unpredictable way. For all of our design talent and all of our expertise, we can design the most perfect experience, right? the most perfect set of features, 
customer experience, interaction model, whatever it is. And we can refine it and plan it in great detail and think that it's going to work beautifully, right? And then we put it in the field and we see what happens, right? And the things that happen, we can't predict because human nature and culture change the way that people interact with the products and services that we create out there. They never crash. We watched this for a while. It goes on for a while. It's amazing, actually. It's really amazing, right? But you could never have predicted this by building this intersection. No matter how well you planned it, you could not have predicted this human behavior. And despite how well you think you know your audience, right? <laughs> Doesn't happen. <laughs> It doesn't matter how well you know your audience, it feels like you think you know what combination of features and services and products are going to change their behavior, but you don't account for people, right? This is Massachusetts, right? Somebody's job was to fix this intersection. And they said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to put up a sign that says, stop and no left turn. And of course, people will obey it. But this is Massachusetts. Right? And if you've ever been there, we have a special name for these people, uh, the, the, the drivers in Massachusetts. Anybody know it? Massholes. <laughs> I didn't say it on video. That's what we call it. Right? Look, there's a good chance you're going to be wrong. Right? And that human factor is the key. Right? Figuring out how humans are going to behave, what they're going to do, is the key. You've heard that throughout the day today, understanding your customers and figuring out what the motivations are and how to improve and how to continuously learn and move that forward. And when you put products and services into the world that try to circumvent human behavior and that try to circumvent traditional practice, the way that your target audience works, culture is always going to win, right? Culture will always beat your best product design idea because people know how they want to live their lives and you're not going to tell them how to do that, right? And so the faster and the sooner that we get these ideas in the market, right, we ship ideas, we sense, and then we respond. We learn from how people are interacting and we optimize that experience over time to move that forward. And so with that, we come back to our hypothesis statement, here's where it is today. We believe, right, that meeting the cost, efficiency, and timeliness concerns of the farmer with greater efficiency, capability, and a license agreement will create less reliance on sales, higher margins, and maintain loyalty. Pretty good, right? How will we know? Well, we have to get evidence, right? The only way we know that that hypothesis is true is if we collect evidence that shows that people actually are doing the things that we expect them to do. And so in Act 5, we find our hero once again, right? There he is, right? The wheat is ripe, needs to be harvested, and the tractor is busted, right? Who are you going to call? Oh, close enough. Lando. You're going to call Lando. You're not going to call Lando. You know who you're going to call? You're going to call this guy. Ukrainian hackers sell cracked John Deere software and hardware on the black market to American farmers so that they can fix their own tractors. Here's an example. This is a black market John Deere, uh, it's, a, it's a hacked, John, cracked John Deere device. Farmers buy this for a couple hundred bucks, they can plug their laptops in and access the software. Right? They sell cracked software right online that farmers install on their machines and are able to bypass the security on the software so that they can swap out a part or fix their tractor so they can harvest the wheat and make their profit. Now, the takeaway from all of this is this. When you enforce bad policy, and that's what you're doing here, right? We're enforcing our business policy, right? People will work around that policy, right? People will find ways to do the things that they need to do to get the job done, to live up to their culture, right? This culture of self-reliance in the farming industry is critical, Right? The ability to self-determine when I can harvest my wheat 
is imperative to me being a farmer. And when you put policy in my way that keeps me from doing that, I'm gonna figure out a way around it, regardless of what that is, as long as I can get the job done. And so then how does our story end? Right, because this is our current hypothesis. <laughs> That's the evidence that we've collected. How does the story end? And I hate to say this to you, but ultimately it's up to you. As makers of digital products, as designers of experiences, of digital products and services, right? You have a choice to make. The laws that govern technology will never, in any country, keep up with the pace, the continuously changing nature of technology, right? As makers of digital products, you have to find the right balance between the law, between business models, and between customer experience and customer needs. Because again, the, the legal structures that support your customers are ill-suited for our current reality. They just simply can't keep up, right? Legislation will never move as fast as technology. And so inevitably, there are going to be these gaps between what you can do and what you should do. And when you find yourself kind of sitting at that gap, wondering if you should design this thing or build this service or make it that thing, right, the question is, is then, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna use those gaps to serve customers, or are you gonna use those gaps to exploit those customers? Because again, both will get you paid. The question is, where do you actually wanna play? Right? Where do you wanna work? What's the kind of work that you wanna do? In addition to laws not keeping up with technology, technology will never get ahead of culture. Right? You're not gonna change people's imperative to be a farmer. Right? If, especially if it's generational, right? My father was a farmer, grandfather, great-grandfarmer, right? If that's what you do, right, you're not gonna change the way that we do things. How do you complement that? How do you support that? How do you make them more successful? Because again, when you enforce bad policy, people will work around that policy. Now you see the reaction to this. I, sh I showed you the Ukrainian hacker thing. There's a broader reaction to this happening across the United States as well, and it's called the right to repair movement. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of bipartisan, which is rare these days, right? It's a bipartisan, uh, tr cross, kind of cross-state venture where people are rising up essentially and they're saying, look, we are going to start to collect the elements that we need to be able to fix our tractors, our coffee machines, our iPhones, whatever it is. There are little manifest manifestos that talk about how this is a sustainable practice. This is a green practice. It's a creative endeavor. It teaches children uh, self-sufficiency. It teaches them creativity. It teaches them design. Right? You're seeing the rise of sites like ifixit.org, which is a repository of service manuals and repair codes that aren't publicly available so people can fix their cars. Right? And their digital toasters and whatever it is that broke down that they spent a bunch of money on and they can no longer fix. Right? And so this is the evidence that we're collecting about the kind of mixed hardware and software experiences that we're creating. And it's up to us to determine what we do with that information, with that evidence, and how we start to restructure and redesign the experiences that we're building. And so to bring this all home, as you kind of contemplate everything you've learned here today and take things back with you to work on Monday. First and foremost, remember this, no matter what you do, no matter what you make, no matter what the product or the service is that you ship or how long you've been in business, you are first and foremost in the software business. It is the only way to compete, it is the only way to scale in uh, the 21st century. Now the amazing thing about the software business is that it unlocks new business models. You have this amazing opportunity, you've been in the tractor business for 100 years, all of a sudden you've got this amazing big data play, right? That's essentially what it is, big data into efficiency, right? All of a sudden you've got services, API integrations, all these opportunities to build new business models and think those through. The code that you write, the designs that you make, the products that you manage, will enforce the policies of your employer and they'll enforce the policies of your business. Right? You'll write that into the code. You'll write that into the design. You'll, you know, you'll kind of mold that into the design of the products that you build. 
But the culture of the people that you make products and services for will always trump that policy. So if you don't take that into account, they will find a way around it, or they'll simply abandon your product. So you have to make sure that the customer is always centered there. Now, to learn that, if you don't know that as a company, if you haven't been around 100 years, right, build in these feedback loops. Talk to your customers, you heard about that. Test new ideas, right? Get those ideas out there. Build those regular interactions with your customers to reveal those cultural aspects that are going to get in the way, perhaps, of what you're currently thinking, the experience you're currently thinking about designing. And then lastly, and perhaps most importantly, is this. Frame your success in user-centric terms. Right? It's not enough to sell tractors, but did you make customers successful? We heard earlier about not making a better camera, but making a badass photographer. Same thing here. You're not making a better tractor, right? You're making a badass farmer. Thanks very much for listening. So a photo was taken of uh, your talk, and the slide that was up was the technology cannot get ahead of culture. Mm -hmm. That was that slide. The question is, how do you complement and support this rather than exploit users? That's exactly. That's my question to you. All right, essentially, that's, that's, I think the only way to, to complement this is to understand that culture. Now, if you're going into uh, an industry like farming, for example, right, a generational, traditional business, uh, or, some, or any kind of a practice that's been around a long time, and you're not a subject matter expert, it's imperative on you to, to learn that culture, to understand the motivations, and to see how, that, uh, how that's going to affect the interactions with your products and services. I, um, there's two, two actually anecdotes that I have related to that. The first is I, I gave this talk um, two weeks ago in Silicon Valley, down in Mountain View, California, um, and uh, in classic Silicon Valley sort of uh, uh, point of view, I guess. Um, one, one, one guy raised his hand after I gave the talk and he said, why don't we just automate the whole thing? Right? Like, get, just cut the humans out of it. Right? Which, again, from, from a purely engineering or a computer science kind of point of view, I, I, can see, I, I see the logic behind it. But the suggestion is that we end farming, right, by humans completely. Right? Something that's been going on for tens of thousands of years. Right? You can't do that. Right? There, you can't, that, that's not the right approach, in my opinion, to solving this particular problem, right? is understanding that. And in fact, complementary to, to that anecdote was when we were talking to the farmers uh, and researching for this talk, we asked that kind of question. We said, look, at some point, right, where is this all going? It's going to full automation. And, and what does that mean? And, and every farmer that we talked to said, that means I don't want to get out of bed in the morning anymore. Right? I have nothing to wake up to do anymore, and I don't know how to do anything else. Right? And so you have to understand that culture, embed yourself in that culture, and make sure that you're solving, even for the edge cases, right? like this, to make sure that people can do what they need to do, or you start to break that trust and break that loyalty. In terms of John Deere, and with the uh, Ukrainian hackers, um, how are John Deere trying to respond to that? What is their response in hackers trying to hack code and sell something that can stop them from doing their work, if that makes sense. Well, look, I mean, I, I, I would look at it this way, right? That's your competition, right? The Ukrainian hackers are now your competition, right? They're, they're providing um, something that your customers need. To me, that's market feedback. That's market feedback that we are not uh, fulfilling our entire brand promise or the value of the, of the system that we've designed and that there has to be more that we can do to fill this. We certainly don't want to leave this to the Ukrainian hackers and just be like, ah, it's an edge case and let them do it. Because realistically, we have no idea what code is actually going into those devices and neither do the farmers who are downloading it. And ultimately, as these things do get more automated, you know, they're big machines. It's dangerous to have a combine sort of running on its own with uh, black market code uh, sort of 
coursing through its veins, yeah. right? So this, I think this is an issue for John Deere and they need, they need to address it, see it as the competition and figure out why that behavior is even happening and it's, it's obvious why it's happening. It's, this is not a, a new thing for them. They know this is happening um, and figure out how to deal with this in a way that allows them to maintain uh, the integrity uh, of their business and yet still meet customer needs. Yeah, I think if we kind of swap that around from tractors randomly to uh, Adobe, for instance, and the fact that, you know, Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator and the whole huge package that we used to have before something like Creative Cloud came yeah. out, where it turned into subscription, you were talking about £750, it was like $1,000 for the software package. People got pissed off, they didn't want to pay the price, they started hacking the software, and then you push a group of people who need something far enough, and then you end up with something like Sketch. Sketch is now out. Yeah. How do Adobe respond to come back with Creative Cloud? But that takes innovation, and obviously they're trying to now push other pieces of software out. In terms of organizations like that, and John Deere, and other organizations that the people here might be a part of, as designers and other professionals, we've got to kind of get in there to try and get that innovation to kick off. Is it again a case of trying to get everybody in the right room to make sure that they're trying to focus on the user needs and then keep going from that point? I think it's, I think look, it's, it's the only way to ensure that you're succeeding is to make sure that your customers are succeeding, right? If you find yourself in a situation where the price of your, of your product has gone to the point where people aren't buying it anymore and they're looking for cracked versions on the market, and we've all done that, right, particularly, right? It's, um, it, that's evidence. Right? That's not evidence that you should tighten the protections on your software. It's evidence that you can, should reconsider your business model. And kudos to Adobe for, for really dramatically, it took them a little while, maybe, maybe a little late, but they did it and they did it fast.